Okay, um, there's still a couple of people joining. Put them in and then we'll, uh, we'll get underway. All right, well, um, oops, still have a few people coming in. We'll just give them a second. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the, uh, to, the, to our event uh, this evening. Thank you for, uh, for taking the time to, uh, to join us and for your interest in, uh, in CPAWS Ottawa Valley. Um, so my name is uh, John McDonald. I'm the executive director of the Ottawa Valley chapter of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, or CPAWS Ottawa Valley for short. Donc, euh, la, 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 la session de, de ce soir va se, euh, se faire surtout euh, en anglais, mais euh, nous vous invitons à nous euh, faire part de vos questions en français ou en anglais et euh, nous allons euh, nous faire un plaisir de, de vous répondre dans la, la langue de votre choix. Um, so I'd like to uh, begin this evening by acknowledging that I'm coming to you uh, from the, uh, the Ottawa region on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin okay. Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the, uh, that the Algonquin people are the customary keepers and defenders of the Ottawa River watershed and its tributary, and its tributary valleys like the Coulonge, Noir, and Dumouin, where uh, where CIPAS has, uh, has spent much, much time working. Uh, I would like to honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this bountiful territory. At uh, CIPAWS Ottawa Valley, we commit to upholding and uplifting the voices and values of our host nation as we gather here uh, this evening. So this evening, I'm, uh, we're, I'm pleased to, uh, to be the, uh, the host and moderator for a, a virtual fireside chat with uh, Dr. Stephen Woodley of the World Commission on Protected Areas on the key outcomes uh, from December's COP15 Biodiversity Summit in Montreal, uh, which, um, as you may have heard, included a, a global framework agreed to by uh, 196 countries to uh, protect at least 30% of the planet's natural environments by 2030. Um, and so Stephen will, uh, will share his insights into the, the process leading up to this agreement um, you know, the agreement itself and, and more importantly, I think how we can, you know, deliver on these ambitious uh, targets to halt and ultimately reverse the decline of biodiversity, you know, both here at home in the Ottawa Valley and, and, and more, uh, you know, and globally. So, uh, Stephen is uh, an ecologist who has uh, worked in the field of environmental conservation as a consultant, field biologist, university researcher, and the first chief scientist for Parks Canada. He currently works as vice chair for science and biodiversity at the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature's World Commission on Protected Areas. And the focus of Stephen's current work is to understand the role of protected areas as a solution to the, the current global conservation challenges. Um, so before uh, passing the, um, uh, this, uh, the mic off to, uh, to Stephen, just a couple of quick housekeeping uh, details. So the uh, the session uh, this evening will be uh, will be recorded. Uh, we'll be sharing it on our social media. Um, I just I'd ask everyone to uh, to mute their uh, their microphones uh, what, when not speaking. Uh, you know, do feel free to leave your cameras open if you would like. It's always nice to see who we're uh, interacting with. Uh, there will be uh, the, the format for this evening is uh, you know a short presentation of approximately twenty minutes from Stephen. And then there will be uh, ample time at the end for questions. Uh, you can type your questions into the chat as they as they come to you, or um, or we can uh, or you can use the, the raise hand function uh, at that point in time. Um, and um, and um, and so with that, um, I'd like to uh, you know thank Stephen for uh, for joining us this evening, and I'll uh, I'll pass it uh, to you, Stephen. OK, merci, Jean. Bonjour à tous. Uh, je vais parler en anglais, um, but uh, I, I hope we can have a discussion in whatever language people choose later. Um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm quite excited. There's so many people here tonight and interested in this topic. I, I personally think everybody should be in, interested in this topic because this is really the, this is really the global treaty, which is about nature conservation. And I, I, I'll try and explain um, how, it, how the implications are for Canada and and even locally. Th this photograph is, a, is actually taken inside the meeting. And you have, you have to uh, appreciate, there were 18,000 people signed up for this meeting. I don't know how, how many actually came to the venue, but I think probably there was at any one time, perhaps 10,000 people um, in the venue. It's, it's a giant event, uh, 196 countries, uh, each one with a large delegation. And you can imagine the logistics of trying to negotiate a treaty in this kind of format. It's quite staggering that the globe actually did agree on, on a global biodiversity uh, framework. Probably people know some of the treaties on this list. I, I could have made a much longer list. There's, there's lots of treaties that have to do with nature conservation. Everyone probably knows the one on climate change because it gets so much press, but this one convention on biological diversity is, is the main one for, for nature conservation, for biodiversity conservation. And there's many others that you may be familiar with, like CITES on the trade of species or world heritage. The Convention on Biological Diversity has been around for a while. It was, uh, it was first signed at the Earth Summit in Rio, so it's part of the so-called Rio Conventions. It focuses the conservation of biological diversity, but it has a bunch of components. The sustainable use uh, of nature, fair and equitable sharing of benefits uh, arising from genetic resources, and on biotechnology, the so-called Cartagena Protocol. So it's a big, complex treaty. It's international law, but the, the strange thing about all these international treaties, with a few exceptions, is that there's no enforcement mechanism. So that, that means enforcement is done by, um, by the will of countries and the demand of the population that they actually follow through uh, on these things. This graphic is explains the reason that we need a global biodiversity framework. I think as everybody on this call will know well, the state of nature is declining dramatically oh, by whatever metric you can use. And we're, we're studying that now in ever more excruciating deta detail. If we follow a business as usual line, the black bottom line, we're, we're in for a dire future. If we just do some things well, we're into a less dire, but still undesirable, highly undesirable future for humanity. And the hope is that we can put together a package of, of ideas and programs and implement them so we, we can actually halt and reverse the decline in nature of which we're part. Um, and this is what this curve illustrates made by the late great Georgina Mace. This is the second kick at the can because we already had a strategic plan for biodiversity signed in 2010 with the so-called IACHI targets of which there were 20. We did not succeed in implementing the IACHI targets. And there was a lot of discussion leading up to this meeting about why these were unsuccessful, at least in part, and what we need to do differently in order to make them successful. So now we have the bright new shiny global biodiversity framework and the, the mission and vision statements that are on the screen here, um, they're, pretty, they're pretty good. I mean, it says by 2050, we're gonna ensure that biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and widely used. Um, sustaining a healthy planet, grand, grand stuff. And, and the vision is we're gonna take urgent action to halt and reverse that curve uh, of, of biodiversity loss. This rather complex diagram basically shows the 20, well, there's actually 23 targets. I, we drafted this paper when there were only 21, but there were two more added in Montreal. But the point of this is to show that 
it's not just the implementation of one target, which is going to lead to the achievement of the goals. All of the targets achieved uh, uh, are necessary to achieve the goals. And this, this graphic we did just shows the strength of the individual targets in their relative contributions to, in this case, goal A. And the point is, implementing 30 by 30, which is target three, is not going to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. It's critical. We need to do it. And it's what our interest is as CPAWs and, and friends who are on this call. But we need to implement all 21 targets, or 23 targets, rather, if we're going to be successful. The, the, there are four big goals. The go goal A is the one specifically on nature conservation, and, and it's uh, divided into ecosystem species and genes, really the definition of, of biodiversity. And I'm going to talk um, just briefly tonight about some of the targets, the ones which are most, uh, most relevant to, to area-based um, conservation. Before I do that, I want to say that I'm, I'm absolutely delighted we came to this agreement. I didn't think we would in Montreal. I, I thought the, the forests were against a global agreement, but a global agreement was pulled off, but it's not perfect. I think it's good, but it's not perfect. There was, in order to get agreement, we lost quantification. We lost specific numerical targets in many cases. The targets are often have been generalized, so they're not smart in being specific and measurable and therefore achievable and relevant. Um, some of the sustainable use targets are, are probably likely weaker than ACHI. I'll touch on that briefly. Uh, the target on the reduction of subsidies, we have trillions of dollars in subsidies which harm nature uh, in the world, uh, is weak. It was watered down to get agreement. And the connection to the climate crisis is there, but it's tenuous. Um, and then there's no mandatory reporting on business. And in the draft, there was mandatory for reporting for businesses on how they impact nature. So those are some of the weaknesses, um, which we can discuss later if you'd like. But let's, let's go into the, into the goals and some of the things which are good. So target two, um, I'm going to get to target three, but target three is on uh, target two is on restoration, and it actually went up in terms of a number. We've agreed globally that we're going to restore um, 30 percent of the degraded lands and wa inland waters and marine systems of the world, which is huge. It's an enormous commitment. It's going to cost trillions of dollars to do this. Um, there's a lot of work to do on defining what is, what, what is degraded and where it is. There'll be a range of outcomes, but this is an enormous achievement uh, to get global agreement on this. And you know, if we, if we think about big protected areas in, that have whole watersheds, like in the Des Moines, you know, there's some restoration that has to happen in there. This can contribute to the, those, those kind, it can contribute to target three, actually. Target Eight on climate change. Uh, the, the final was that we're we're going to minimize the impact of climate change, um, in and and look at its relationship with nature through nature-based solutions. I that was a that was a compromise position because there's no numeric target in it. And here, here's an example where we went downhill in reaching agreement because the draft target said we were going to use nature to contribute 10 gigatons of CO2 per year to global mitigation efforts. So that, that number was taken out and it's kind of, it shows you the kind of compromise. And the reason that's so fundamental, I think, is if we're going to keep below 1.5 degrees, which everybody knows is the climate change target, there's no way to do that without nature. There's no path in any, uh, in, in any of the solutions put forward by UNFCCC, which gives us success without nature conservation, because nature's already absorbing half of the carbon we, we're putting into the air, um, and you know, thirty percent of that of the problem has been caused by land and sea degradation. So I really think we still have work ahead in the next few years 
to make the connection to nature and climate much more explicit in these global treaties. This, this new framework has a lot to say about Indigenous participation, which was great. This is one of the areas where it was strengthened in Montreal. Um, I'm not going to read you Target 21, but the fact that it's so long tells you how much interest there was in this target and how much people wanted to get into it. Um, when we, w w as we move forward with protected areas and OECMs under target three, everybody is on the same page globally. We're going to do this with the full partnership, free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples and, and local communities. So that was a really important outcome for Montreal. Um, the target 10 was a bit of a disappointment and it relates to, 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 to nature conservation because, well, first of all, they lumped everything together. They lumped agriculture, fisheries, and forestry under one target and they weren't before and they're really very different and, and, and have very different outcomes. So it's, a, it's unfortunate they get lumped into one target the the thing when we when we talk about target three because it got so much oxygen in Montreal that a lot of the things that people want to shove into target three should actually be here in target ten so uh, things like sustainable forestry um, and I, I we need as much energy and focus on this target and indeed the others as we have on target three but let's move to target three because I think that's everybody's interest who's on this call. It's longer than ACHI. Uh, it contains some, most of the same elements of ACHI. Um, on, on the right, it, and you will have this presentation, you can see a, um, a link to a science brief. And this was a science brief that was done by Giobon. I actually wrote this one um, to provide parties background information on the science behind all of these targets. But this, this says we're going to protect 30% of land, sea, and fresh water um, uh, by 2030, which is an enormous lift for, for the world. Um, it, it includes the whole ocean, it doesn't just include coast, the coastal waters. Um, it, um, it focuses on areas important for biodiversity and really a whole range of, of Qualitative elements are in this long target. And then you'll see at the at the bottom that it's going to be done recognizing and respecting the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. So that th that phrase on indigenous peoples and local communities is repeated throughout the targets. Um, and it is really through the whole bio global biodiversity framework. So let's explore some of the elements of this target three. Um, IUCN produced this document on what counts, and it, it, it looks at really the draft target three because it was produced before Montreal to help get an agreement. But the, the, the key messages from this are that we're only talking about protected areas and OECMs. This will include applicable indigenous territories, should they want them. Um, it supports for all four governance types recognized by IUCN, and this includes uh, in Indigenous communities as a governance type. Provides clarity on what OECMs are, and if you don't know this term, I'll, I'll give you a minute on it to try and explain it. But the key message is it's not about the percent target, because we can get to 30% protection and not make a very big dent in biodiversity conservation. It's got to be in the right spot. If we put, because nature is not evenly distributed on the planet, if we put them in the right spot, we're going to be high, way more effective in conserving nature than we would if we just get to 30%. So we need both. We need the qualitative and the quantitative elements to be both achieved in this target. Um, the focus on areas of importance for biodiversity, there's lots of there, there's lots of specific guidance on this. One of them is on key biodiversity areas. 
And the, these are sites which contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. And the IUCN has a standard on this. And that standard is being really well implemented right now in Canada. And if you don't know about this, um, please go to the KBA Canada website. And they've done, they're in the, this, this team is, is a, up at around a thousand sites now identified across the country to look at, at key biodiversity. Uh, areas which can link to target three. So I said I would talk a minute on OECMs. They were first, this term was first coined in uh, during the Aichi targets in, when they were defined in Japan in 2010. Um, these are areas which aren't protected areas, but still are governed and managed in ways that achieve positive and sustained long-term outcomes for the in situ or in place conservation of biodiversity. Uh, they must be, they're supposed to be complementary to protected areas. They're supposed to be, uh, be long-term, have sound governance systems and focused on areas of importance for biodiversity. And most, more importantly, they're not supposed to be multiple use production areas like production forests or, or managed fisheries areas, which are which are best put under target 10. They can be things like indigenous uh, communities who want to make sure their lands are recognized, but they don't want to be called a protected area for whatever reason. They can be war graves. They can be uh, big watershed protection areas like in Vancouver, um, where they were set up for watershed protection, but they're actually important for biodiversity as well. They can be remnant prairies, which are protected by military reserves, as in the case of Shiloh, Manitoba. So a whole range of things which give biodiversity outcomes are OECMs. And you're going to hear a lot more about this in the future. Um, in, in target three, it says they're, they're, to be, they're to be connected. And IUCN has put together a, a guideline on ecological connectivity. So we're actually setting this up to be reported by countries to look at how well connected these, these conservation systems are um, into the future. So let's get into the lo implementation locally. Uh, we, we've got this global agreement uh, on, on CBD target three, where we're gonna do 30 by 30. We have Canada along with over a hundred countries in the world already members of the so-called high ambition coalition or, or the hack. Uh, it's 30 by 30 is government policy in Canada. But as you know, in Canada, <laughs> when the federal government agrees to things, the, the, in terms of nature conservation, the action happens in the provinces and territories. In Quebec, the, the uh, Quebec is, it was the first province to commit to 30 by 30 as government policy. And uh, the premier of, of, of Quebec was very much front and center at the meeting in Montreal. We spoke, he spoke really well. And I think countries appreciated him, uh, him being there and, and showing, uh, showing leadership in 30 by 30. Since CEPAS OV covers both Quebec and Ontario, I have to ask the question of Ontario, where are you? Because they, there, there's no policy on this for Ontario, and Ontario has not been active at all in terms of moving ahead its conservation estate um, relative to many other places in Canada. CPAWS, um, and actually my wife was a co-author on this report, has put a roadmap to 20 by 30. I highly recommend you look at this. Um, the key messages are you know, we need, we need collaboration if we're going to get to these 30 by 30 targets. Um, we've got to set amb ambitious regional targets, and maybe CEPAS OV can help with that. Um, we've got to prioritize Indigenous-led conservation. Um, if, if you just add up all the things people are working on right across the country, you get a long way to, to 30 by 30. Um, from a very ground up perspective. So there's room for both ground up and top down uh, conservation planning, such as the use of KBAs. Um, the graph in, in the right hand side at the bottom looks at where we are. So the blue is protected areas, 
the orange is OECMs and the gray bars are total. So right now, in, in we're we're at about uh, thirteen percent on land and about nine percent marine. Um, sorry, and about thirteen percent marine. We're both the total is the same. The relative proportions of OECMs and protected areas are different. So we've got to go from 13% to 30 in seven years. That's uh, that's going to be a dramatic change in, in land use and sea use uh, in our country. The key steps, I think, to move forward in implementation are to combine these top-down and bottom-up approaches. Um, we've got to we've got to support both in terms of governance and financially, First Nations leadership on this. Uh, I think we've got a link to climate solutions. You know, we have some of the most high carbon ecosystems in the world in Canada. You know, if if I was in if I was making the decisions my, myself, I would take the whole Hudson Bay Lowlands um, and work with First Nations there to make sure it was all protected. We got to look at where biodiversity values and high carbon values overlap. And Canada is one of the most carbon rich countries uh, on the planet. So there's lots of room for co collaboration there. Um, and the fifth one is, we've. I think we have to use a three conditions model for implementing um, implementing this. And I'll, I'll briefly explain what that is in this map. So there's three colors on this map representing really three conditions for conservation. The, the red, at the bottom is where we all live, like 95% of Canada lives in the red zone there. And that, that's where virtually all our cities and uh, uh, farms and all the intensive land use is located. The, the greenish color is where we do kind of extensive harvest or forestry and mining, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the blue is where nature's still pretty much intact in Canada, and we're lucky to have that. Um, but what we're going to do in those three zones is going to be different. Um, in the in the blue zone, the intact zone, we're, we don't have to worry about ecological connectivity; it's already there. We have to do kind of a, a conservation first planning to keep intactness there, um, ensure we protect high carbon values, protect area demanding species like caribou. In the green zone, we're going to use a kind of classic nodes and corridors kind of conservation with big protected areas. Uh, we've got to ensure large cores, ensure connectivity, plan by watersheds. And down where we all live, it's, you know, it's not, we're not going to have nearly as much government or indigenous action. We're going to have private land trusts. We're going to focus a lot on restoration, that target two. And uh, we're going to have to have incentives for conservation on, on private lands. So there were, uh, this is my last slide. There were a bunch of announcements. Um, one of the things that's great about having a meeting like this in Canada is that it, it allows uh, governments to um, to showcase where they want to make a difference. And this is this list, which I won't read to you in the interest of time, but it, it, it was done by uh, several, several territorial and provincial governments, by, by national governments um, and, and First Nations. And it's really, it's an exciting list of things that were announced, funding that was announced, um, to to further this agenda. So I think it's up to all of us to uh, to get familiar with this program, to hold governments to account, to uh, when it comes to election time, ask them how they're going to make good on, on their international uh, promises under international law. So I'll stop there, John. Thank you. Thanks very much to everybody. And uh, but hopefully we can have a good fireside discussion. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, we do have a, uh, so we do have time for questions. Um, 
We do have one question in the chat already, and uh, it's a very good question in terms of the uh, the restored lands you were uh, you were talking about, Stephen. Um, so, are we talking about restoring thirty percent and then um, thirty percent protected areas, or will the uh, restored lands be qualify for protected area status? Well, I think the answer, it could be either. I think that as we make new protected areas, um, if, if the lands that we restore are important for protected areas, if they're important for biodiversity or, or ecosystem services, then they could certainly be protected areas. You know, we have to keep in mind that not all lands are degraded in Canada. We have a certain percentage of Canada that's degraded and, and will qualify as being degraded but we're we can uh, we we're talking about protecting at least thirty percent of that by twenty thirty. I'll give you an example in the prairies. The prairies are highly degraded by oil and gas. You know, we put in this network of roads and all these pump jack sites, and and it's been really negative for the prairies. There's still some good patches of prairies, some great seed sources around these degraded lands. It's it's right, it seems to me, for, for ecological restoration uh, to get back and, and recover many of those species at risk or on the prairies. Just one example. So, so we do have a, uh, a couple of other questions, a lot of really good questions. So the question about the, um, the federal biodiversity accountability law, any information, uh, Stephen, on the timing or what might be uh, included in this uh, in this uh, this law um hello to julie who asked the question um i don't i don't have any information or timing on that you probably know better than i do but um I, you know i kind of mostly work internationally and it'd be better better place for someone who works nationally to uh, uh to answer that question but i'm sorry i, I can't i i don't know We have a, a, another really good question, and uh, certainly one that I think uh, a lot of us share in the uh, conservation community in uh, working in Ontario. So what measures uh, do you think are, are possible, Stephen, to encourage uh, recalcitrant provinces like Ontario to change their policies and to do more to, to meet these targets? How do we get them on board? Well, that's sure not a science question. I'm sure everybody in on this call would have their own answers to that to that particular question. I mean, I would have mine, but I don't know. Um, it, we all know because I, I know many of the names on this on this call, and you've all worked in the trenches, or many of you have worked in the trenches of conservation. You you know how this works. You have to build an agenda. You have to build public support. You have to build that public support into, into the institutional relations. It's hard work. It's agenda building. There's no one size fits all solution to this uh, ever, but um, you know, it really requires a movement and uh, uh, it, it requires a, a suite of NGOs taking on different roles, um, et cetera. That would be my answer. But I, I, since this is a fireside chat, I'd, I'd really welcome to hear others. Um, yeah, and, and certainly, uh, you know, do feel free, free to, uh, you know, chime in the, uh, in the chat if you have any, uh, you know, any comments to share. Um, so just moving along, we do have a few more questions um, from, uh, from participants. So um, Joanna asks, uh, 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 you know, Canada is a, a very large country, what will happen after we reach the 30% target. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of people wonder, um, you know, what will happen to the remaining 70%? Um, questions like that. I don't know, Stephen, if, if you're comfortable addressing that. Completely. And, you know, I tried to start this off by saying, we're not gonna be, we're not gonna bend the curve on biodiversity loss by protecting 30% or implementing target three, even if we did target three perfectly. Uh, which we likely won't. Um, you know, the 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 twenty the twenty three targets 
uh, despite my criticism that uh, of it, I just didn't want to present a Pollyanna picture. Um, th those cover 100%. You know, those are meant to cover 100% of the of the globe, and by default, Canada. In and these are th these are global targets, so they'll be implemented differently in different countries. But you know, one of the targets is on subsidies, for example. Um, we we give subsidies to oil and gas and agriculture and forestry in the in the billions of dollars. And so it's a call to review all of those subsidies and remove the ones which are negative to biodiversity conservation. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we have to do well um, if we're if we're going to uh, bend this curve on on biodiversity loss. You know, if we get to 30%, hallelujah, I'm sure we'll all, we'll all cheer, but we should only cheer when we've bent the curve. You know, 30 by 30 is a tool to bend the curve in biodiversity loss and, and reestablish our dreadfully uh, warped relationship with nature that, we, that we've established on this planet. Um, a good. We have a question from uh, from Rita in terms of the um, the the criteria and uh, the qualitative aspect of, of biodiversity. Um, were there any criteria agreed upon, um, Stephen, um, in terms of the qualitative aspects of biodiversity? Um, Yes, can I can I answer the question just above it first, uh, John? If you don't won't mind, I'll get to them both because Nick's asked the question: Which countries were not on board with this outcome? And I, I think the answer is, in the end, everybody was on board with this outcome, the thirty by thirty outcome, because they all voted for it. Uh, they're going into the Montreal meeting. There were already a hundred countries that that had signed up to the High Ambition Coalition. But you all know enough about how this works to realize that this was years of work. It was years of work by the high, by the by the High Ambition Coalition, funding by donors, um, and and lots of work by NGOs to get these countries on board, um, so that this could even be a possibility. Um, the holdout countries, there were some holdout countries, but they weren't holding out against 30 by 30 necessarily. They were holding up on the broader deal, and it was mostly about money. Because if we're going to make this happen globally, there's got to be this massive transfer of wealth and capacity from the so-called global north to the so-called global south. I only use those terms because I don't know better ones to use. Um, and that was led by Brazil. It was led by Brazil and Uganda, some some countries like that. You know, Brazil was saying, "Listen, you you rich countries have gotten rich by exploiting the hell out of your ecosystems, and now you don't want us to do it. You think we should we should save the Amazon? Okay, if you want to protect the Amazon and you think it's important in a global treaty, then you're going to have to pay for it. And and the the financial deal was really the tipping point which made the what I'll call the substantive deal happen and and the financial deal is is been agreed to but there's still a lot of work to do on it um and uh, if we're going to be successful it's the financiers um and the ministers of finance that are going to make this a possibility um to happen just like in Canada I mean we have big money now in Canada for nature conservation, largely due to the work of the NGO community, including CPAWS. And, and uh, that, took, that took a decade of hard work to, to make this happen. Um, so in terms of which areas are most important for biodiversity, under the KBA standard, there's a whole bunch of criteria. There are things like areas, areas uh, that are important for uh, endangered species, such as critical habitat, um, in, endangered ecosystems, uh, high concentration areas, such as fish spawning sites or migratory bird uh, concentration areas, 
um, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's a range of these that are established. They're written in guidance documents under the CBD. Um, Every country is asked to implement these according to national circumstances. So there's some there's some room uh, for for a negotiation. Uh, high carbon value ecosystems are important, etc. Hope that answers that question. Yeah, well, thank you, Stephen. Um, so I saw a, a comment from Elena, and uh, this uh, this session is being recorded, and we will be sharing it on our social media and our YouTube. And uh, certainly encourage everyone here to uh, you know to to share that in your own networks. Um, I just want to make sure I haven't missed any any questions. Um, there's a um, a question about um, you know has there been any uh, measure of success in holding publicly traded companies um, accountable or 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 compelling them to abandon unsustainable practices in terms of uh, biodiversity. Yeah, so, so one of the targets, and this is, hello, Elena, one, one of the targets actually speaks to uh, com traded public companies or private companies saying, listen, here's, here's the impact of my company on biodiversity. So if I'm building Teslas or, or building water pumps, you know, you, you put a declaration out saying, saying what the impact is gonna be on nature. This idea is spreading right around the world. Um, they, we, tried to, we tried to put it in the global biodiversity framework as a necessary requirement. Um, it was, we weren't successful at getting it as a necessary requirement, but you know the global biodiversity framework isn't the only show in town. Lots of the development banks, the World Bank uh, are putting in these kinds of criteria on um, on companies and companies are agreeing to it through their own sustainability models. So there's there's a lot of good work done in that area, and uh, even though it didn't make it as a must do in the target, um, the people who know much more about this than I do um, say that there's big progress being made uh, in this, and uh, and companies are coming on board. Okay. Um, so, a question from uh, from Stephen, and uh, in terms of uh, so that the question from Stephen is the uh, is the question uh, you know what is a species relevant to the matter of policies for implementing COP fifteen and protecting biodiversity? Um, it it sure is, Stephen, and and uh, the, the the question of of subspecies is, is also really important. And I know this is an in, of interest to you. At the, at the global level, um, IUCN has the red list of species and, and it, it has a, a global system for, for defining what a system, what a species is and defining what level of endangerment it, um, it poses. But at the national level, most national organizations, in this case, COSEWIC, go below the species level. And in Canada, we use the term designatable unit. Um, so it goes, it goes below the species level, and I think accounts for most of the things that you talk about. For, for example, with, with orcas in, on the West Coast, we, a designatable unit is the Southern resident orca, um, you know, which, at a global level, they would just all be called orcas. So it is important to designate below species, and but I think it's being done properly um, at the uh, at the national level rather than the global level. So we have a, uh, a question from uh, from Andre. Um, uh, a very good question. Is there any? Any reporting system uh, built into the COP15 agreement or other agreements to, to track progress or, you know, or lack thereof? Yeah, very much so. It, it really is part. There was a monitoring framework that agreed to in Montreal. Uh, still has some work to be done on it. Uh, there's also the Global Biodiversity Outlook, which is done by experts and, and sums up the monitoring um, uh, data and, and gives us gives us a, an idea of how well biodiversity is faring. There's also the IPBIS reports. 
So, so very much, very much tracking is part of this system. And people, people realized that the tracking system we had for the ACHI targets was not, was highly imperfect. And there's a huge effort to make it more perfect now. Uh, but, it, but it's certainly there. And uh, one uh, sort of our last question, we do have time for, for a few more uh, from, uh, from Mark in terms of the 30% uh, uh, ocean goal. Is that by area or, or by volume? Very interesting okay. question. Good question. I, I like this question a lot. It, it, it's by area. It's by area. But when you get into the nitty gritty of marine protected areas, which is kind of outside CEPA's uh, OV, but um, th this question becomes really germane because lots of times countries or interests want to segregate the, the ocean by depth and, and, and say protect only the benthic area of the ocean up into, you know, for the first 200 meters or something like that, and then allow fishing above it. So um, the, so the so-called vertical zoned protected areas is a highly controversial subject in the in the marine world, but the goal itself, for, in terms of area, is for the surface area. Right, and um, a good another good question, uh, Stephen. Right up, uh, right up your uh, your alley in terms of uh, incentives and strategies. Uh, to uh, for uh, the conservation of private land. Um, yeah, it's th th that that question is obviously really important and uh, and and fits with the three conditions approach, but it's a little too detailed for a global biodiversity framework. We didn't get to that level of detail. Um, just a couple of notes on that, Rita. If you look at the four governance types in indig in addition to indigenous uh, governance type, private land is is a governance type, and there's a there's a separate IECN guidance documents on privately protected areas. Um, but the actual strategies and incentives it would be considered to be a national or even subnational um, uh, issue rather than uh, a global one. Um, so I think we've come to the end of the questions in the uh, in the chat function. Uh, if you do have uh, another, other questions, we free, oh, we do have one that just popped in from Sabrina. Um, so uh, essentially, for for Canada, uh, Sabrina is afraid we will. Um, sorry, my chat is feel wonky. We'll concentrate on the the northern, uh, you know, intact areas for for conservation, and that areas in the south, like the Ottawa Valley and and elsewhere, um, which are already quite degraded, uh, you know, will be will be largely ignored. Um, and um, you know, I, I think we all know that southern habitats are are very important, um, and. Uh, do you think the government will be motivated to work here as well? Yeah, I'm so, sorry about the phone. It's I got a ringer in this office, but I don't have the phone. It'll shut off in a minute. Um, I'm not sure if I share your concern on that, Sabrina. I think all, all of the three conditions are critical. I think the people, we have this in Canada, this pathway to target one, uh, which target one was was Canada's version of the old Hatchy 11, which is basically the nature conservation target. So we already have a federal provincial territorial table working on this. They're very aware of the three conditions. They're very aware that you need to do different things in different places. Probably if you look at the money being spent in total, we're spending far more money on the South in those degraded landscapes than we are in the north, um, in in terms in terms of conservation, so um, I I I'm not sure if um, if I share your concern uh, that we'll only concentrate on the northern. Okay, so uh, 
Um, I think that is the, uh, the last question in the chat. I mean, if I missed uh, your question, um, feel free to use the uh, the raise hand function. And uh, um, I, I and, would love uh, to hear people, John, on not just hearing from me to make this a conversation. You know, how do you get recalcitrant yeah. provinces like Ontario on board? You know, it, it, it's not just it's not a matter of political stripe because we've seen co good conservation done by all political stripes in this in this country. You know, we have a we have a government in Quebec who who people might argue is more, uh, more a more conservative government, but it's still very much um, uh, very much on side with thirty by thirty. Um, and so, how, how do we? How do we crack that nut? Any brilliant in, insights? I would love to hear them. I think many of us in the conservation space were hoping that uh, you know financial incentives from the federal government would bring provinces like that on board. And I think there's been some success. Oop, I see uh, Max has uh, his hand up. You can unmute uh, yourself, Max. Okay, hi, John. Yeah, it's Max here. So I think going back to that question, private lands, especially in Southern habitats and how we, what are the incentives to uh, regenerate those lands is really, really important. Um, the incentives right now are usually to subdivide and develop them. And uh, also when we get more and more mega millionaires buying up huge tracts of wild lands or abandoned farmlands, uh, this becomes, they become significant players in conservation. Um, so I just think we can't, you know, private lands are a big, big piece of this puzzle. In the South in particular, not in the North, of course. Um, uh, Louise, I see your hand is up. Uh, yes, I'm, it's just a comment. Um, I, I wouldn't give Monsieur Legault, um, you know, too much credibility when it comes to being green. I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I, even if I'm called Legault also. <laughs> but um, it's a it's a new thing for him. Um, he he talks a good talk, but. <laughs> I still want to see him do it, don't I? <laughs> so we do have a couple of uh, some insight in the in the chat. I won't necessarily read them, but I think you know framing the uh, you know the economic value of conservation, uh, and that's something we've been doing in, at CPAS OV in terms of. You know, looking at economic diversification of places like the Pontiac or Renfrew County, um, and and certainly there's been some traction there. Um, and um, so there's a, a comment from David McNichol. Um, I don't know, David, if you'd like to unmute yourself and uh, and speak to it. Yeah, sorry. Um, the the corollary is that in the 40 years, Stephen, that I've been involved trying to work toward conservation, I've never seen Canada act as a, um, a totality in terms of the human population. So it's a theoretical question. What I'm really saying is in your work, do you actually encounter accountable countries where they act as a total, as a whole of government. Yeah, many countries, of course, David, do not have our federated system. You know, we we have a federated system with with significant um, management over, over ecosystems, nature uh, given to the provinces, um, and in places like Namibia, they don't. So they have far more uh, far more whole of government approach. Um, uh, 
than than we do. I mean, I suppose there's pros and cons to that, but you know that's the struggle for any government in managing Canada is that we have that, that we have to manage uh, all these provinces and territories with often very different ideas. Uh, Lynn, I see uh, your hand is up. You'd like to unmute yourself? Um, I think we've lost. Uh, sorry. Lost uh, no, Lynn. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, to mention something. Uh, that uh, something I've I've was at a lecture the lot in the last couple of weeks, and it related to ways we can influence um, agendas around climate issues. And the speaker was had been quite involved in physician activism, and her, she had done a report on what kinds of um, some of the um, influences that actually affect politicians. And one of the things that politicians said was that receiving comments, having meetings, speaking directly to individuals really influenced them. And I found that very powerful. And I think we need to also support NGOs, et cetera, but I don't think it's enough. I think we have to call our Paul. I live in Ontario. I'm appalled by Bill 23. And so, you know, I need to talk to my counselor. I need to talk to my MPP. I need to talk to my federal, and I need to do it individually because I think that the numbers the individual numbers get exponentially um, expanded in the minds of people who are making decisions for us. Anyway, that was just a comment. Well, I think well said, Lynn. There's no, there's no substitute for, uh, for engaged citizenry in, in making these kinds of decisions. And, and as much as we might not think that governments listen to citizens uh, all the evidence I have from is that uh, is that they do so we have a, a hand up from uh, from Catherine uh, Fletcher and then there's a comment from Mark in the chat about Ontario's uh, crown land so Catherine I thanks uh, John um, on the question of I thought Lynn you did a great job of um, um, responding to, to the question of what we can do as individuals and to help sway governments. And I think that we just have to really not get tired out and not get um, exhausted about um, things that we perceive as real problems, you know, with the, which we can all discuss till the cows come home. So what can we do? We can write about it. We can talk about it. We can, in, we can engage with NGOs. And I'm involved with CPAWS Ottawa Valley with the draw, which is the Des Moines River Artists for Wilderness, because I'm doing art now, visual art. We can all find a professional niche where we feel comfortable and we can act. And we shouldn't be um, pointing and pointing fingers and blaming other people, we can go look in the mirror and act ourselves. And I think that being engaged and finding people who have um, comparable voices, um, and that's where joining something like CPAWS is really, really important, um, or other organizations, obviously. But I, I can't emphasize more, uh, more uh, that it's so important to find a level of um, uh, both readership and language where people aren't um, completely overwhelmed with what you're trying to say. People have talked to me with my environment column, for instance, just saying, well, where have all the little birds gone? Well, they could live in the ditches. Who cares about the forest being depleted? Well, you know, it's, it's at that very, very basic level that we, and I don't mean to insult anybody, obviously, but we need to reach out in ways where people can understand what the basic issues are, because we're all connected, and those little birds can't nest in ditches. So we need to, you know, get with the program and act 
all of us can do something. Well, well said, Catherine. I, John, if I can just um, close here, I, I think that yep. um, this, this global biodiversity framework is a big deal. I mean, this is the whole world essentially agreeing on, on something pretty significant to save nature. It's, it's, it's big, it's complex, but it's not that complex. And I, I, I recommend you all read it and, 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 and try and figure out what it means and, and talk, with, talk about it with your government um, representatives. You know, this is something we've agreed to do. And you know, th this, this isn't a surprise to any of the provinces because they were all consulted on this at federal provincial meetings. And we do have federal provincial territorial tables to implement this. So, and, and it does apply to the 100% of Canada. It's not just 30%. 30% is part of the solution, critical part of the solution, but um, th this is far bigger than that. It really touches uh, all elements of our lives uh, from what we consume to, to uh, uh, you know, where we, where we decide to grow our crops. And uh, it's, I'm excited we got it done. Uh, and uh, I hope you see optimism in, in, its, uh, in its making. Thank you, uh, thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> um, so, uh, with that, uh, you know, thanks again, Stephen, for for joining us this evening and for your, uh, you know, your uh, your your uh, your your, uh, your words of uh, encouragement. I think there's a lot for organizations like CPAWS to to do, and for us as individuals to do. Um, I'd like to uh, just before uh, people uh, people sign off, uh, just a uh, reminder: this is a uh, part of our monthly series of uh, what we call CPAS cafes. So we invite you to join us again in February and uh, for the uh, the next one. Uh, the topic will be uh, made available uh, very soon. We have a, an exciting lineup. We just need to confirm a, a few details, but. Uh, it's generally the, the last Monday of the month. And, um, and if you're uh, not already a CPAWS supporter and if you'd like to get involved, uh, you know, I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes after, uh, after this to chat. And uh, you can also uh, find out more about what we do on our website or by following us on social media. Uh, we do have a, a number of events coming up. There's a dinner in uh, in Fall Plange on uh, February 10th in support of CPAWS. And uh, we have a snowshoe day on February 19th. And again, all the details of those events are on our website and social media. So hope to see you there. And uh, if, uh, if you'd like to uh, get more involved as a volunteer or as a, uh, as a supporter, uh, I'll put my email address in the chat and, uh, and do feel free to reach out. And if you have any questions about the work we're doing in the region, uh, similarly, do feel free to, uh, to connect with us. So thank you. Uh, thank you once again, Stephen. I, uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us this evening. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, good night, everyone. And thank you once again.